For Crema Media's Polity, I am Shannon DeRayhove. Award-winning singer and songwriter PJ Powers joins me to talk about her autobiography, Here I Am, written with Marion Tam. You knew at age 17 that you wanted and were going to be a famous singer. What was the biggest challenge you faced in your journey? Um, sorry, I have to correct you. I knew that I was going to be a famous singer by the time I was five. Um, I used to follow my sister around with a microphone saying, please interview me, please interview me, because in my head, I was a famous singer. By the time I got to 17 and matriculated, my biggest obstacle was my parents, were my parents, my father in particular. He was not at all happy about having a daughter that was going to go into rock and roll, you know. Um, I come from that kind of family where you go to school, you go to university, and I just didn't fit that mould, and I never, I never fitted in. Your career has had both its ups and downs. Tell us about these moments, as well as the most important lessons you learned during these times. You know, my career has definitely had more ups than downs. The downs I created, the ups have been unbelievable, you know, singing at the World Cup rugby was unbelievable. I think my, my first complete high was going into Soweto on the 31st of May in 1982 and being embraced by the black people of this country. The book is set against the backdrop of South Africa and the time. And my career broke as a white woman in Soweto, which anyone not knowing the country or anyone not having bothered to go back and see, to know what the history is, knows that 82 to 93 was the most prolonged period of violence that this country ever experienced. So for me to suddenly be embraced by what we had been, thank goodness, not my parents, because my parents were very, uh, they were liberal thinking. My grandmother started, you know, was part of the African Children's Feeding Scheme. But a lot of people had been taught to fear black people. Um, I was one of the lucky ones that uh, I, I've never experienced that fear. What advice would you offer to young South Africans who want to break into the difficult and pressurized world of show business? Um, well, the biggest, the biggest uh, thing for me at the moment, and the bugbear, and, 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 and the reason that I can't watch the, the, the idols of, of South Africa, I mean, partly because of two of the judges, mainly because of two of the judges who shall remain nameless, um, I just find that when I look at that, I see no encouragement of originality. I see that People want to regurgitate Whitney Houston, Celine Dion, whether it be the latest people, the Christina Perrys. You can't be a second-hand anything. And nobody wants to be a second-hand anything. And most of all, no one wants to hear a second-hand anything. So if you're going to do a cover, which I have done a few of, you've got to completely flip it on its head and you've got to make it your own. And when I sit and I watch these and the youngsters, is I don't want to sound like anyone else but PJ Powers and that's why my career has lasted over 30 years. And my biggest fear for young artists is they're just hell-bent on sounding like someone else. The opening chapter of your book is a deeply painful and horrifying insight into your struggle with alcohol. Why did you start the book this way and why did you decide to expose yourself this way? Well I think that um, Having been sober for five years and having um, done the AA journey and done the, the well, am doing the AA journey and keep doing the 12 steps, um, I think that I have a lot to offer in terms of helping people. With regards to uh, starting with that chapter, what happened was Marianne and I were an amazing team to write a book. And when Penguin said, you've got to meet Marianne Tam, and we met, uh, within 20 minutes, we both knew we, we were right for each other. I never had to explain myself politically, age-wise, uh, sexually, in any way. I, I didn't have to explain myself. She, we, as I said earlier, she had a brain. But the one thing she didn't get was the level of self-destruction I could get to. So when she wrote that chapter, I was very tearful. Um, as you can imagine, and but I was also aghast at how precisely she put my feelings 
into words how accurately she had described how I felt in those moments. And we just decided that it was the most profound way um, to start the book. It also doesn't make it a, a you know, a, this little girl that gets born that becomes a big star, then she starts drinking and then she ends up in the doldrums and now she's a, you know, it would have been pretty trite the other way around, you know, I think. And, you know, it very clearly says not quite the end. That's the chapter. Tell us about the process of integrating Penelope, your birth name, PJ, your stage name, and Tandeka, your Soweto name. With which of these three personas do you most resonate with and why? Um, you know, Tandeka is something that I am, it's a very sacred thing for me to have and it's a very, very special place in my heart. But probably PJ Powers because, you know, I think one of the reasons I ended up in trouble was I created three different personalities, which actually was stupid of me because I am all of one. Um, but I left Penelope Jane Dunlop at home in Durban at 17 and came to Johannesburg. I didn't address any of her fears. I just swept it under the table. I didn't address be always being the fattest and, um, and the ugliest never get invited to the school dances. I, ne I left that all behind. And in a way, I don't feel sorry for myself. That sounds like a, oh, oh catch the pills moment. I don't, because what I had to do, which is, with, which is what these sort of young, ingenue type, gorgeous women didn't do, is I had to develop a personality. I had to develop um, a way to make people laugh, sing, entertain, so that I would be, part of the in crowd anyway. Because let's face it, when you're young and you're growing up, all you want to do is fit in. You know, when you get older and you're a little different, you think you're quite smart. But when you're young, that's all you want to do. So I wanted to be invited to the parties. I wanted to. And how it turned out was because I'd had to fill these other baskets, if you want to call them that, um, that, were, that I had to develop other parts of my personality. I was on the top of the party list anyway, you know, so in a way it worked for me. But uh, we all know that pain causes growth. Tell us about your childhood nanny or housekeeper Lillian. How much, if at all, did she influence your journey and your fight against apartheid? Lillian was not a political woman. Um, Lillian was my nanny and very much my nanny. That's what South Africa was like at the time. Lillian was my first sort of soft landing. She brought us up at the expense of her own children. Having said that, my, parent, my mother and her got on like a house on fire and are both very determined women. And Lillian was, I think, in a, in a very subtle way, Lillian took away any fear that I had that black people were out to get us. And they weren't. They never were. And she was my, f she was the first foray into that. I mean, there's that picture in the book. I'm 18 months old. I mean, 16 months. I didn't even know how to walk. And there is a black woman teaching me how to walk. I had to trust her, you know. And so therefore it set me up for a life of no fear. I think that's the biggest thing that Lil gave me. And we speak to each other once a week or twice a week on the phone. <laughs> Where and does she live? She lives in Amlazi, but she's coming up to see my mum because it's my mum, it's, her, it's Lillian's 80th birthday in October. So we're flying her up, we're going to have a family reunion. During the 1980s, you were recruited as a courier for the ANC and eventually joined the party as a card carrying member. How do you feel now about the current state of the party and what, in your opinion, needs to change? Um, I became a card carrying member of the ANC in 1983. Um, I started careering for them in about 1987, or was it after I was banned? I can't remember. But um, how do I feel about the ANC now? The African National Congress was a freedom fighting organization. They were revolutionists, and you know, um, as a government, I think it's very difficult to go from being 
um, fighting one common enemy and they did it very well um, and it was very organized but I will never turn my back on the ANC but there's one thing I don't do which I think too many South Africans do um, who were all put, put their crosses next to the ANC when it was Madiba's face was there and then even a few when Tabo Mbeki was there and I think that we're quite childish in that we at this point in time are defining the ANC by Jacob Zuma and Jacob Zuma is a person the ANC is a the, the African National Congress is a a party that has fought long and hard for our freedom and I won't I will not forget that Throughout your book, a recurring insecurity is the unease you feel with your body and your weight. How has this changed as you've grown older? And what would you tell South African women who struggle with these same feelings? Uh, how has it changed? Um, it's not still hysterical, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, but I've learned to, um, I've learned to temper it more and, and I'm, not as, not as, I'm, I'm not as hard on myself. How would I attempt to give advice to to people that felt the same way as I did and feel the same way sometimes still as I do. Um, first of all, do something about it. You know, like anything in life, I can't bear people that whinge and do nothing about it. Um, and secondly, don't define yourself by that. And thirdly, know that there is what you're being given there is an opportunity to work from the inside out as opposed to from the outside in. What's next for PJ Powers? We are in negotiations at the moment about the documentary and the film of the book. Um, very importantly, which I really want people to come and see, is when I was in that dark moment in the hospital, because you've read the book and it's in the first chapter anyway, is and it was absolute darkness and I heard my sister say is she going to live and the doctor said we're doing all we can basically there are no guarantees it was in that blackness that I spotted what I call my firefly because you can only see a, a firefly when it, there's complete darkness and what happened was I saw my firefly and I knew at that moment it was a very defining moment that I didn't want to die and I've taken all of that and I've done I've written a show called Firefly which is on at the Joburg Theatre between the 17th of September and the 28th. So only 10 shows, because that's all my schedule will permit. And it goes from You're So Good To Me, which was the first, it takes you right through Soweto. It takes you to the very, very funny things. I mean, I've had some funny things. Lying on a sunbed with Sharon Stone was just not one of the things that I enjoyed in my life. You know, I mean, I mistook, I mistook, um, what's his name, Robert De Niro, for a Mexican beggar and oh my god it's just all um, I've had done some really silly things um, so all of that is an anecdote it's self it's quite self-deprecating it's funny it's um, it's got some sad moments in it but it's all it's it's a bit of chit chat but it's strung together it's the musical version of this you know basically and Marilyn Van Rennen wrote that with Marilyn Van Rennen wrote that with me Marilyn and I have been friends and and lots of other things for many, many years. And um, she directed me in Firefly and uh, I think did quite a good job judging by the Cape Town audiences. That was PJ Powers speaking to Crema Media's Polity about her autobiography, Here I Am, penned with Marion Tam.